Hello, um, this is part two of the, uh, po- uh, the two linked podcasts that takes you through the key points about German agriculture uh, in the 25 year period from the start of World War I uh, to the outbreak of World War II in 1939. Uh, in the first podcast uh, we covered, uh, just zooming in here, we covered the first few subheadings German agriculture during the war immediately after and broadly in the 1920s. And we've identified uh, certain uh, key uh, themes. I mean, the overarching theme is that agriculture uh, uh, was very stagnant in Germany. It was a feature before World War I in the Kaiserreich uh, because uh, much of the economic development was uh, industry, in other words, the cities, urban areas rather than rural areas. Uh, certainly agriculture was badly hit during World War I and uh, the key feature of the, the 1920s again was relative stagnation. Um, the Weimar Republic was known for sort of uh, uh, a lot of American money and technology was used to develop the economy but uh, a lot of that went into the uh, cities uh, rather than the countryside. Uh, another feature we picked up there, just to sort of like to recap some of those early points, was that uh, a feature of German agriculture was small farms. There were large Prussian junk farms in the east, but uh, the, the majority of German farmers were relatively small uh, land, ho- land holdings. Uh, they benefited briefly from the hyperinflation, where many fa- farmers were able to pay off their uh, mortgages uh, because of the loss of value of the currency uh, but uh, poor investment remember poor uh, business decisions in the middle of the 1920s did not help uh, so a series of problems uh, were, were compounding uh, as we move towards the late 1920s okay which is uh, the sort of uh, area that we uh, reached in the previous podcast um, uh, high taxation, rural indebtedness, those are the sort of like the, the, the final points that we covered there. Okay, so let's get into uh, the beginning of the, uh, the, the, the prolonged crisis really that began in 1928, the agricultural crisis. So, what we're basically saying is agriculture was relatively stagnant, uh, it really was not developing at the same pace as industry. Uh, and then in 1928, and this is before the Great Depression. Remember, the Great Depression, the Wall Street crash happened in October 1929. A crisis actually hit agriculture in 1928. Now, we mentioned in the previous podcast uh, the, the problem of worldwide overproduction, okay, and that really uh, reached its peak. Uh, in 1928, which basically caused uh, a crash, an agricultural crash. Wheat and and rye prices dropped by 35% uh, in 1928, and agricultural income nearly halved. Uh, So, big, big impact in 1928 on farmers. The average income in agriculture was 44% below the national average. So that's uh, that's, uh, some useful statistics there about uh, the state of German agriculture as we move into 1928. So again, uh, we're not talking about a massive a change, we're talking about an acceleration. It's the same features, but are now becoming more pronounced. So the land flight, which has been an ongoing problem of agriculture ever since Germany was united in 1871, really began to accelerate in the late 1920s, especially uh, girls leaving the countryside looking for new opportunities in the cities. What we therefore see in 1928 is anger. Okay, We talked in the previous podcast about how farmers had always gravitated to the right wing, attracted by the stab in the back uh, mythology, but we're now seeing increasing anger beginning to appear. Uh, a feeling that the Republic simply was not working for their interests. And so it's building on that sort of dormant disillusionment. It's been sitting there uh, since the early 1920s uh, and is now becoming compounded as we move into the late 1920s. And we actually see tax strikes, protests and even violence uh, 
uh, in some rural areas, particularly in the rural north of Germany, uh, Schleswig and Holstein, uh, near the border with Denmark. Uh, and interestingly, that uh, was a, a major area of, uh, where the Nazis began to make uh, first inroads into the vote. Okay. So the golden era that we're talking about was not such a golden era for agriculture. Okay, that's uh, uh, yeah, GCSE, we often talk about 1924 to 29 as being a golden era for Germany. And it certainly was a golden era in many ways uh, if you lived in the cities. Uh, but the problems that we talk about with the Great Depression that began in 1929 had already started in the countryside before the Wall Street crash hit, hit Germany. And then, of course... The Wall Street crash did hit Germany, which marked the beginning of the Great Depression. Uh, so the Great Depression began in October 1929, and it accelerated the crisis that had already started in the countryside. And of course, it accelerated it uh, in the sense that it now became an urban, it became a crisis in the cities as well as in the countryside. So a lot more people were being, uh, were, were, were being hit. So... A depression, remember, is the opposite of an inflation. So the key feature of the Great Depression was prices declined again. So that, in terms of agriculture, led to a further decline in agricultural prices. Uh, remember, that's compounded by the fact that there was very, very high taxation. And during the uh, period 1929 to 1933, you've got Chancellor Bruning, nicknamed the Hunger the Chancellor, uh, and he, his policy was an austerity program uh, where basically to pay for unemployment benefits, he increased taxes. So you've got farmers who are basically paying high taxes and a massive de decline in the prices of their products on the market uh, and a collapse in international trade. Uh, so more and more bankruptcies. So that's impacting across Germany. It's in cities as well as in the countryside. But the, the process that's already happening in the countryside is now accelerating, 1929 to 33. Uh, brooding, on the whole, did not help uh, farmers. Uh, what's interesting is what, one of the key, the, the few ways in which the government did help was it offered aid to the big farms in the east. Uh, now, what's interesting there, of course, is the big farms were run by the junkers. Okay, and the Junkers were the uh, political uh, establishment that was sitting behind the government, uh, arguably pulling the strings. Hindenburg, the president of Germany, was himself a Junker. So the Osthilfe uh, Eastern Aid Program, uh, in a sense, backfired on uh, the government. Uh, it became a political scandal. Information was leaked. It became known that the wealthy Junkers, including uh, President Hindenburg's own son Oscar, who was a big landowner, uh, a lot of the money was being siphoned off uh, for their own benefits, so that became a political scandal. Okay, so the Nazis. Uh, small Nazi party uh, in 1928, just 2.6% of the national vote. Uh, what's interesting is Remember, 1928 is before the Great Depression, but this is the agricultural recession. Although on a national scale, the Nazis were a very small party, they made their first gains in the countryside, in these depressed rural areas. I mentioned, for example, Schleswig, where the riots were. The Nazis made substantial uh, gains in local village elections uh, and regional elections. So although they, do, they weren't doing very well in the national Reichstag elections, they were making substantial gains locally. So they did especially well, we've mentioned Schleswig and Holstein, but also Lower Saxony, Thuringia, and Upper Bavaria, Bavaria down in the south. That was not accidental. Okay? The Nazi party uh, were very sharp at, uh, at, uh, at evaluating where there was discontent. They could see that the rural areas were unhappy, and so they deliberately focused their propaganda uh, on the rural areas. Then, of course, 1929, the impact of the Great Depression, the Nazi vote accelerated across all social areas. 
uh, they, they were gaining votes in the cities as well, uh, and the Nazis burst onto the political scene. 1930, they were the second largest party in the Reichstag. Their vote, their national vote, went up from 2.6% to 18%, and then by 1932, their vote had increased uh, to 37% by July. But they continued to be especially popular with rural voters. Okay. Uh, so there's the 18%, their the big breakthrough in September 1930. They made their biggest gains in the areas in, that were dependent on small family-owned farms. So what about our agriculture then after the Nazis took power? Okay, So Hitler and the Nazis took power in 1933. I suppose the, the, the first thing is, is that the, the, there were high expectations by the rural workers. Okay, uh, the Nazis had really, really targeted um, them, uh, the, their, their group. Their propaganda had always promised that they would promote, uh, that they would support the needs of rural workers uh, if Hitler took power. Um, to some extent, those promises were genuinely meant as well. Okay, they were not just pragmatic promises, i.e., the Nazis saying that to get their vote. But they were ideological promises. Okay, so we'll do more about Nazi ideology uh, when we get into the depth study. But the Nazis believed in survival of the fittest. They were what we call social Darwinists, and we have talked about social Darwinism before. Remember, what social Darwinists did is they latched onto the scientific ideas of Charles Darwin, uh, in which in the law of nature, the strong will win through. And the Nazis believed in that ideology, they believed in ruthlessness, that the weak should go under, that the strong should be promoted. That was part of their racial ideology. And very much part of that, therefore, that idea of the law of nature, was their belief that the best German blood was in the countryside that the German people who were closest to nature were more likely to be the strongest racial types. And that's what we call blood and soil ideology, which the Nazis promoted in their propaganda. They mythologised German peasantry as being the most racially pure Germans. So the point I'm making here is that the, the, the Nazi promises to... Uh, in the, when they were campaigning for power, that, that, that when they took power, that they would support the peasants was not just an opportunist thing. It was not just about grabbing their votes. Uh, it was genuinely meant. Okay, But the key feature is this. When Hitler took power in 1933, he struggled to actually fulfil his promises to the peasants. Why? For exactly the same reasons that we've uh, looked at in the 1920s and in the Kaiserreich, the general trend of society was towards urbanisation. And especially with the Nazis, because the key focus of the Nazi economy was to prepare for war. It was rearmament. Okay? You can't rearm by developing a rural economy. You rearm by developing industry, by developing cities. Weapons are made in factories in cities. So, no matter how much Hitler promised to support the peasants, the land flight continued under Nazi rule. The peasants did not really do well, because the Nazi economy naturally had to support urbanisation and industry rather than agriculture. So the agricultural decline continued into the 1930s under Nazi rule, and generally there was a continued low standard of living, a decline of the standard of living of German farmers, because of the investment went into industry, uh, modernisation was industrial rather than in farming techniques, so farming techniques lagged behind. Now, that does not mean the Nazis did not try to support the peasants. They, they offered them greater subsidies, but basically they were unable to reverse that decline. Uh, to some extent, uh, in some areas, uh, one of the key features was, uh, um, remember the Nazis promoted self-sufficiency, or what we call autarky. Uh, we've already spoken about that during World War I. Uh, remember Hitler... Uh, 
learn from World War I that uh, Germany had been under a blockade and one of the reasons Germany lost World War I was because Germany was so dependent on imports that she was starved out of the war. So a key aspect of Nazi policy was to promote self-sufficiency uh, and that was what we call the Schacht uh, New Plan of 1934 uh, which restricted imports. Uh, that obviously to some extent benefited German farmers uh, but it really was too little. Uh, the general trend was towards modernisation of industry and so the agricultural decline continued in the 1930s. Okay, so that's an overview really of the key features of uh, agriculture 1914 to 39. Um, uh, obviously if you've got any questions, please ask. Thank you.